Hi all, welcome back to the Stat Dose podcast. We're here with another Tobo Dose today and we're going to be going through the general approach to abdominal pain and we're going to focus on the acute abdomen and hopefully this will sort of provide you with a systematic way with which to approach patients presenting with acute abdominal pain. So when we talk about the acute abdomen, we generally mean any sort of severe abdominal pain, generally of less than 24 hours onset. And obviously there are lots of potential causes for that, lots of differentials when you're seeing these patients. Clinically, it's important to detect the presence of peritonism because this would point towards a surgical cause and obviously impacts on your initial management and, and the ongoing care for that patient. Peritonism clinically is suggested by a patient if they lie very still or lie very flat, a firm or rigid abdomen when you're palpating, or percussion tenderness, so when you're percussing over the abdomen, that hurts more than simple palpation, and involuntary guarding, where the muscles of the abdomen move um, in response to you palpating. This is different from voluntary guarding, where the patient themselves essentially either sits up a little bit or tries to manoeuvre themselves in a way to try and stop you palpating. That's different from involuntary guarding, which suggests an actual peritonism. So moving on to causes then, Joe, there's a few ways we can look at different causes. There's so many to go through. What sort of ways can we split it up? I like to um, split the abdomen up and you can do that in, in a number of ways, either through a simple sort of four quadrants and think about the underlying anatomy there, or you can do nine different regions. So if we think about this in a, in a more quadrant based, so we start at the right lower quadrant. And usually this is typified by people thinking immediately appendicitis. That's the sort of most common. But on top of that, what we have to remember is that you can get right lower quadrant pain that is to do with gynecologic emergencies, such as ovarian torsion, ectopic pregnancies, ruptured ovarian cysts. Um, and in addition to that, uh, referred pain from testicular torsion and or other testicular and uh, genital urinary conditions. So whether that's a kind of epididymo or orchitis or something similar. Moving up to the right upper quadrant, we're thinking more about your biliary elements there. So biliary colic, cholecystitis and, and cholangitis, and also really thinking about renal colic. Now, renal colic can be right upper quadrant, right, right lower quadrant. And something that we need to also consider in all of these areas are your sort of atypical presentations. So uh, that of a triple A. Matt, when, you, when we're sort of looking at the left upper quadrant, it's quite a tricky diagnosis very often. And so I'm going to give that to you as the more difficult one to describe. So what do you think? Oh, th thanks for that, firstly. Yeah, I, I think I agree about the, in terms of the left upper quadrant, it's, it's often it's more of an atypical type presentation. So I have to put my thinking hat on and I don't like doing that. Um, <laughs> the, the key sort of obvious organs up there are the, uh, the stomach and the spleen and the kidney. Um, so we're sort of thinking, is this uh, you know, gastric related? Is it a, a hernia? Is it reflux? Is it uh, possibly gastritis or, or you know, peptic ulcer or something like that? Is it uh, pain from, from a renal colic, uh, as I mentioned there? Um, you don't tend to get too many splenic um, issues unless you're in the context of trauma. Um, you can get splenic infarcts, but they're very rare. The other thing to consider is, is it referred from, uh, from a chest pain? So is it actually something like a a lower lobe pneumonia, for example, or some sort of disease process going on there, pleural effusion, etc. And then the other thing I suppose to consider is the, again, the sort of the slightly atypical biliary presentation. So is this a, a slightly atypical pancreatitis? Is it slightly atypical cholecystitis and things? Yeah, absolutely. And then thinking about what you've just said about referred chest pain, I think that's reasonable. And it's not just that left upper quadrant. So I'd like to revise my uh, right upper quadrant, <laughs> right upper quadrant answer and, and, and sort of uh, double down on that and say that you, both, both of those sort of upper areas of the abdomen, you really have to think about chest referral processes. I think that's particularly important in thinking about your MIs, microinfarctions, mm. but it's also quite common in children as well. Lower respiratory tract infections being one of those areas where you can cause kind of localised upper tummy pain. And then, so what do you think about the left left lower quadrant then? I mean, this is a really common presentation to us, isn't it? In somebody over the age of 50, I think the first thing that goes through your head is this diverticulitis. So that's obviously going to give you pain in the left lower quadrant, often associated with a bit of PR bleeding, or a bit of rectal bleeding um, and, and pyrexia and things. But so the, the other big things to consider in the left lower quadrant, again, is, is it a gynae related pain? So as you said, you know, torsion, ectopic uh, assist and things. Is it referred from the testicles again, as you, as you were mentioning there? 
Um, and I suppose, again, it, it could be a weird sort of atypical renal colic, an unusual presentation of AAA. But I think, yeah, diverticulitis, gynecological causes and, and referred pain from the testes are the, the big three in that uh, left lower quadrant. And thinking about that, it's really significant that when you're thinking about those GU presentations, what that should spark in you is, do I need to do an exam of more than the abdomen? Mm. And I think actually in those younger patients, for example, it almost behooves you to to perform an examination there. Yeah, I think to, especially in, in young men and in the pubescent males, if you if you have somebody with low abdominal pain, you should check the testicles. I mean, it's always worth a check because you don't want to miss a torsion. So that's a run through of a locational type model. The other way to think about it is the underlying pathology. And we can break that down more into a sort of bleeding, perforation, ischemia and an inflammation, really, can't we, Matt? And so what do you think about in terms of uh, bleeding? The key to remember is that the GI tract is very long. Um, hopefully that isn't used to any of our students, but you can bleed into a part of it and you can lose a significant portion of blood volume before you might present to hospital. So actually these patients can come in shocked. They can come in hypotensive, sweaty, tachycardic, pale, etc. Um, so if you're seeing somebody with abdominal pain or back pain who is a little bit hypotensive or a little bit cardiovascularly unstable, always consider bleeding. Obviously, the, the key things we think about, is it a leaking AAA? Um, feel free to check out our AAA podcast, which is now available. Um, again, is it a, a bleeding sort of peptic ulcer or upper GI bleed? Feel free to check out our podcast on upper GI bleeds. Um, or is it something like a re- ruptured ectopic pregnancy? Again, feel free to check out our podcast <laughs> on ectopic pregnancy. Now that is that is some that is some great PR there, Matt. Yes, yeah, so always do a PR in in subjective bleeding patients oh, as well. No. <laughs> Moving on, the the other thing that we really really want to be um, cognizant of is perforation, uh, and the reason that we want to be co- um, cognizant of this is that per- perforation is essentially going to give you fecal matter or other toxic and or irritable matter in the intra-abdominal uh, cavity in the abdominal pelvic cavity, um, and what that will do is potentially uh, spark an intra-abdominal sepsis. So the, the key cause is here really uh, an obstruction causing causing perf, peptic ulcers being a really significant uh, pathology alongside that. Tumour erosion um, and thus perforation can be a presentation and unfortunately can often be the first presentation of a cancer. Diverticulum can and diverticulitis can cause perforations and, and so can uh, extensive inflammatory bowel disease. Matt, another thing that I'm quite cognizant of when I've when I'm seeing my patients, particularly those who are a little bit older, is the, the ischemic bowel, because it's a really difficult diagnosis. So what do you think about ischemia? Scary presentation. And, and as you say, it's sort of it's often a bit subtle. So you get sort of pain out of proportion to the clinical findings, if that makes sense. So typically these these patients, when they come in with this acute ischemic bowel, have significantly raised lactates. They're often very hypotensive. They require a lot of fluid. And actually, they're sat there reasonably comfortable. Uh, a lot of the time their their abdomens are often soft there's often not a lot to find that 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 peritonism is quite late and it's very difficult to pick up just through the use of the hand i think we often um, rely a little bit too heavily on the on the surgeon's hand in terms of our clinical assessment and actually these what these patients need when you've got somebody with abdominal pain and highly raised lactate who's hypotensive you need to do a, a ct relatively quickly to work out is this ischemic how much of the bowel is still viable um, and these patients need to get to theatre to urgently for for reception of of the affected bowel and as you say it's some of those key risk factors af being one of the one of the big ones if you throw off a clot so alongside af you've got to consider the vascular path patients so those with atherosclerotic risk factors smoking hypertension Considering initial investigations in terms of uh, urine, Matt, I think I'll take this one to avoid you ranting for for 20 minutes about the use of urinalysis. I I do utilise urinalysis. I find it very, very helpful in the context of finding haematuria, particularly when I'm trying to work up a potential renal colic. It can be helpful sometimes in the nonspecific abdominal pain to find potential um, infection and or um, other pathologies but what we have to remember is in over 60s it's very very minimally helpful because there will very often be asymptomatic bacteria catheterized patients similarly there will be asymptomatic bacteria and often if you see positive leaks on the urinalysis that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a urinary tract infection you can get put down a, a wrong pathway with things like appendicitis often giving you uh, positive loops on your urine dip and you really don't want to miss that and be giving somebody trimethoprim and sending them home. 
always, always, always remember to do a pregnancy test in all women of childbearing age, regardless of the history. We do this as a standardised approach. Um, and, and actually, there's been several times where pregnancy for me has been almost completely, in inverted commas, ruled out. However, there's been a pro- positive pregnancy test which completely changes the the diagnostic workup and is potentially life-saving for these patients. Moving on to blood tests. So we obviously want to sort of, you know, a fairly routine set. So a full blood count using the CRP, uh, as we do for most patients. In the context of abdominal pain, though, we also want to check an amylase, helpful for things like pancreatitis. LFTs as well, just while we're thinking about those biliary causes. A bone profile is helpful. So hypercalcemia is uh, a cause certainly of abdominal pain, but is also a, a significant risk factor for lots of other intra-abdominal pathologies, such as renal colic or renal stone formation, uh, pancreatitis as well is another one that, that springs to mind. And also a group and save is helpful. A proportion of these patients are likely to go to theatre and therefore a group and save taken early is just helpful. Um, and then we're going to move on to our, our imaging. And that obviously is going to depend on what the most likely cause is and how unwell the patient is. Um, it's difficult to give sort of general rules, but some of the take home messages from this should be if the patient's unwell or if there is clinically some peritonism, then a CT is going to be the most useful Im- imaging modality in that case. However, if you're looking for any sort of stone disease, so if that's a gallstone, um, ultrasound is going to be the best there. That's the most sensitive. Obviously, if you think it's a gynecological cause, then a, a pervaginal ultrasound is going to be best. It's giving the best images there. Erect chest x-rays are often uh, one of the first line investigations when we're seeing these patients. Now, it's important to to consider that they're a, they're a rule-in test. They're not a rule-out test. A normal erect chest x-ray does not exclude a perforation. So thinking about the management then, uh, we've talked about investigations, but in terms of physical management of these patients, we're clearly going to be doing a, a primary survey in the acute abdominal pain presentation, particularly if these individuals are unwell. And within that survey, we're thinking about IV access um, and thinking about whether we actually need to be escalating for blood products, should there be a quick questionable bleeding. Antiemetics tailored to the uh, location that you think are really, really important and can really uh, benefit patients in my experience. We want to think about analgesia as well. There's been a, a sort of cultural shift away from the old school thinking of no analgesia before the surgeons arrive, uh, which which quite frankly, from my perspective, is a bit barbaric. And the thinking behind that was that it would analgesia would interrupt the surgeon's exam. But actually, the reality is, is that that's been disproved in, in multiple, multiple uh, reviews. We want to consider whether these patients need to be nil by mouth. We, and then on top of that, whether there's the requirement for antibiotics and or intravenous fluids, remembering, of course, that blood products are preferred in the context of a bleeding patient so that you don't get that dilution or coagulopathy and acidosis picture. Treatment of specific pathologies depends on the underlying cause. If there is an unwell patient and or any uncertain diagnoses, then involvement of surgeons early is really important, and particularly if there is a peritonism. So that's a quick run through of our approach to abdominal pain. Just remember that the acute abdomen has multiple different causes. The location of the abdominal pain is is often helpful to distinguish the most likely cause. Just remember there are some causes of severe or generalised abdominal pain, such as bleeding, perforation, ischemia and inflammation. When you're assessing these patients, it's important to try and detect any peritonism, which is going to suggest a surgical cause. Investigations wise, it's likely to include a urine sample, remembering to check a pregnancy test in all women of childbearing age, some blood tests and some imaging based on the most likely underlying cause. Management as ever is with an ABCD approach with a focus on making sure these patients are well out and and involving the surgeons early if there's any peritonism present. So as always guys please feel free to leave us some feedback and get in contact. We're available via email or on Twitter at Pod. 